welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, to, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. Tim Brown. I'm actually going to do a talk today on the strategies involving diabetes treatment and bring us up to speed with the 2022 ADA guidelines. But I also want to put that in perspective with how we're monitoring for diabetes. And then lastly, I'll touch on some of the advances that we're now having with drugs or medications that we're using to manage diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes. I'm the Director of Interprofessional Education for the University of Georgia's College of Pharmacy, but I'm also a professor in pharmacology and toxicology for Augusta University Medical College of Georgia. So I teach both pharmacy and medical students and do a great deal of interaction with regard to programming to make sure that these students uh, learn to work together after graduation in an interprofessional setting. Here are the learning objectives for what I talked about earlier. We're going to talk about monitoring devices for glucose. We're going to talk about guidelines. And we're also going to talk about those treatment options and how they've evolved over time specifically for those dealing with type 2 diabetes. As I mentioned, the 2022 ADA guidelines really did take a step back and say, yes, we've been talking about managing diabetes holistically, but have we really, you know, let that be reflected in how we allow management to be done? And so they stepped back and looked at some key areas, and those pillars are key areas, were ASCVD, heart failure, CKD, and really overall diabetes, the holistic approach. What all do we look at when we look at those aspects with regard to choosing good medications? Well, quite frankly, the ADA is working to keep up because indications and uh, new data is coming out, it seems, monthly these days for some of the products and some of the classes. And that's going to be one of the final things that we discuss during the course of this conversation. I want to point out that the ADA also talked about the fact that you can't just manage diabetes in a bubble. You have to look at blood pressure, which I have the targets there listed for you based on the risk. Also, how you should manage it if they have diabetes. Also, lipids. And I believe the European guidelines just came out once again with changing how they look at LDL goals and percentages as well as ASCBD score percentages that consider, that's considered to be high risk. So if you want to take a look at that, you certainly could. Also know there are several new classes of cholesterol-lowering drugs that are out there. I will be doing a pharmacotherapy update in primary care meds sometime probably in September or October, so that will be included in that as well, so you can tune back in for that CE. And then lastly, really what has grown from this new data coming out with the classes of diabetes medications has been the cross-coverage with cardiovascular disease and CKD, so the comorbidities associated there. We know that aspirin remains a secondary prevention uh, medication. Primary prevention has pretty much fallen away. And CKD has always been covered with ACEs and ARBs, but we know that the classes continue to change. I've listed a brand new drug here for you. Once again, I'll talk about this in the pharmacotherapy lecture in September, October, but it is getting a lot of discussion now about being added on to an ACE or an ARB and those that have diabetes to slow the progression of CKD. So if you're unfamiliar, please look this drug up and you can see what I'm talking about and then we can talk further about it when we do the pharmacotherapy CE in a few months.
Now, I mentioned that the 2022 guidelines looked at the holistic approach. Well, what that did is it impacted the way we look at first-line therapy and type 2 diabetes management. For the longest time, metformin, metformin, and metformin remained the drug of choice, and then we added to it as we saw fit based on comorbidities. That's changed. Now, knowing what we do, we're actually saying that you can supersede metformin, not use it as first-line therapy, and choose a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2 inhibitor depending on the comorbidities that your patient may have. And I've listed those list, I've listed those below. You can see the ones that we're thinking about and dealing with. And I'm going to specifically get into each kind of one of those areas in a moment. So we'll stop talking about those here, and we'll talk about them more when they're associated with a drug class that has impact on them, why they should be first-line therapy in somebody who has type 2 diabetes. But before we get there, not only have drugs evolved, but so has monitoring. The old thought process of pricking your finger four times a day, doing an A1C every three months, while it got us to where we are today, it's not optimal. As a matter of fact, it's much like watching a movie and then turning it off every five minutes and then coming back you know, 15 minutes after you turn it off and trying to catch up to the plot of what's going on. People live their lives daily, not every 90 days, and many people cannot take their blood sugars four times a day. As a matter of fact, studies have shown even if a type 2 diabetic patient does do that, it didn't have any impact on actually making them under better control. So the question I always been is, why are we doing this? Should we do it? Well, times have changed. Glucose monitoring in general is becoming more sophisticated, and the reason for that is because we're seeing personal CGM devices on the market that are now affordable or covered by insurance. For those that are unfamiliar with this, I really want to point out a couple of things. These particular devices work with interstitial fluid, and what happens is when you put them into the tissue, there's an electrochemical sensor component that uses glucose oxidase enzymes to oxidize the glucose, oxidize the glucose, excuse me, and transfer electrons to an electrode. That produces a current. The strength of that current is proportional to the amount of glucose present in that sub-Q space. Because of that, that sensor then converts the electrical current signal into a glucose value that we all identify with. Man, that sounds really complicated, right? Suffice to say, for this to occur, it's not a quick point of care like maybe a finger stick is. So it takes a bit of time, what we'll call warm-up time, for things to get to where they need to be. And I've got that listed here for you as one of the attributes of each of these particular uh, CGMs. I would say that Dexcom G6 and Freestyle Libre are probably the two that most people are familiar with. I will also point out that I've not included here that Libre now has a version number three that is a real-time monitor, while Libre number two is a flash. And you're asking, what the heck is the difference between a flash and a real-time? I'll get to that in a second. But I wanted you to see some of the attributes of each of the ones that are on here, because I think we're seeing a greater number of people getting access to these. And then secondly, it's giving us a huge amount of data to play with. Here's some more attributes that you should uh, be thinking about. The water-resistant one really stands out to me, especially if you have a swimmer, a lifeguard, someone that enjoys doing various aquatic activities. This might be the better one versus, say, the freestyle that's three feet for 30 minutes. And then the indications for ages are listed down below, and you notice the Dexcom and the freestyle both start at four years of age. So we're seeing type 1 diabetes people use this way more than type 2, Matter of fact, insurance pays for it for type 1 patients much easier than type 2. But in a moment, we'll discuss how type 2 market is really opening up with more and more data. So, what is that data? Well, to break it down, when these products, you're looking at them and what's sort of going on, I mentioned real-time and flash earlier. Well, real-time, when I put RT in front of CGM, that means real-time. Real-time is kind of easy to explain. Whenever real-time occurs, it's simply measuring the interstitial fluid glucose every one to five minutes and just sending the results left and right to the transmitter and the data is just piling up. You don't have to do anything. It just happens. So in real-time data, when they use this in type 1 patients in the very first trials that were out there, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation trial and the GOLD trial, they found a 0.35 to 0.6 reduction in baseline based on what was going on for people using multi-dose insulin regimens. So what happened was the A1C actually reduced those percentages and also people spent less time in hypoglycemia. So in type 1 patients, it was very easily proven that CGM had impact, especially real time, which is like a Dexcom, for example. Now, fast forward a bit. 
the question was next, how do you look at adults with type 1, but what about pediatric and adolescents with type 1? Well, they broke it down once again into two trials. The SENSE trial looked at ages 2 to 7 years old. They did not show any A1C improvement, but their time and range, or their euglycemia, improved dramatically. The CITY trial looked at ages 14 to 24. That did show a reduction of about 0.4% in A1C, and also they were euglycemic about 1.7 hours more per day than they were without CGM. You're asking, well, I can't believe this didn't show a greater impact here. I mean, we got 0.6 in the type 1s. The difference? Adherence. Pediatric and adolescent patients did not pay attention to, to actually putting their sensors on, keeping up with all the stuff that was there, and also they would take their sensors off because they didn't want to be monitored all the time. They found that if the patient wore a CGM sensor five times a week, they could see the impact. So five days a week out of seven. Well, a lot of folks didn't do that. Matter of fact, a clinical trial over the age of 24 showed that's when those folks actually became more adherent, at the age of 25. So the SENSE and CITY trial really isn't a good indication because of the adherence issue of both of these end groups, if you will, but involving this with the 143 for SENSE and 153 for CITY. There is a large trial pending, however, from the Libre 3 that I mentioned, the real-time Libre 3, that will be out in September of 2022. I expect to see these numbers change a bit with that uh, increase with regard to Libre 3 real-time and the way it's set up with the numbers that will be involved. When it comes to type 2 patients, this has always been an issue. Finger sticks have never really shown impact, especially if people are taking oral medications. I will say, though, with real-time CGM, there is some data out there, as these came on the market, that showed that there was impact overall when it came to the reduction in A1C. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it's important to realize that these are folks that certainly were in the mix. I can tell you that they were on both orals and insulins, but they didn't really break them down so much for you to know which ones had the greater impact. But they will say that in the top two group, the standard mean difference between these groups, those that were doing CGM and those that weren't, had an A1C, A1C standard mean difference of 0.35, it being 0.35 standard mean difference lower in those using CGM. We also found that those that were type 2 diabetes adults, they had significantly shorter time in hypoglycemia, although they could spend about the same amount of time in hyperglycemia. But the hypoglycemia was a big issue, especially dealing with falls at night and, of course, um, getting up at 4 a.m. with low blood sugars and trying to get them back up. Overall, people that were in this had increased satisfaction if they were in the CGM group. So the real time did show impact, but it wasn't quite as great as what we saw in the type 1 diabetes patients. So that's why insurance really struggled with this in terms of paying for it, because the data just didn't show it was worth the money you had to spend. Go forward. I almost said flash forward, but that would almost be like the flash CGM. When Libre 1 first came on the market, the flash or the intermittent CGM was born. Now, there were inter intermittent ones before this, but no one ever used them. No one really tried. The flash CGM with Libre made it much easier. The sensors were easy to install, so to speak. People could do it at home. And the original trial showed that for type 1 patients, there was a 38% reduction in the average time spent in hypoglycemia. And the replaced trial showed a 55 to 75 percent reduction in hypoglycemia, but it did not show a reduction A1C in the early trials. Once again, difficult to get it paid for if you could show that magical A1C getting to goal number. A European meta-analysis happened right after that that did show a reduction of 0.9 percent, especially in those that were using basal bolus insulin. As a matter of fact, CGMs have always been known to have a better impact in those that are on NDIs. But I will tell you the next trial may be the reason for that. In this particular journal in 2022, type 1 diabetes patients showed a mean A1C reduction of 0.53% and type 2s of 0.42% when looking at this trial with CGM over two years. Here's the catch. People with higher A1Cs responded better to CGM than those with lower A1Cs. So if you think about the number of people on insulin as, it's, as the primary management for a type 2 patient, for example, they usually are the people that are uncontrolled, who've tried everything, who have really high A1Cs. It's interesting how the European meta-analysis showed the reduction and it was much better with those using basal bolus. So it's, it corresponds to what we're learning as this evolves and we're finding more and more about CGMs and how they should be used and quite frankly, who they benefit.
But I will tell you this, even with the clinical trials being done mostly in insulin, some of the newer trials that are coming out from Libre 2, for example, you will see that those taking oral medications actually had an A1C reduction as well when they use CGM. In particular, once again, if their baseline A1Cs are double digits, we're seeing a greater impact by using CGM, even if they're simply using metformin and another oral medication, such as an SGLT2 inhibitor. So just keep that in mind that the data is out there and we're seeing more and more come up, especially for those that are what we'll call not at goal or uncontrolled. Now, speaking not at goal, goal, one of the, the aspects that I found amazing as I was putting this together was, you know, keeping the blood sugar log and doing an estimated average glucose and looking at A1Cs, like, oh yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this, right? The reality of life is the metrics are changing as well to keep up with CGM. We now have access to data streaming in constantly, every one to five minutes with a real time. With the flash, they actually have to swipe over that sensor I was talking about. That's why it's called flash or intermittent. There's an action that has to occur. So, for example, if you want somebody to look at their blood sugars two hours after they've eaten, they can flash or swipe their transmitter or receiver over that sensor, which many times can be their phone and it will record their glucose as they swap past it. No matter which way that data comes in, it's much easier now to grab a lot of sugars over the course of a day. This creates an ambulatory glucose profile that's looked at over around two weeks. You're looking at coefficient of variation here. What's the variability of the glucose? Is it going from 50 to 300, or is it staying 100 to 150? How does that work? And so that percentage of change, if you will, if you can keep that below 36% for the co coefficient of variation, that's what you're looking for. You're like, oh gosh, there's no way I'm going to do coefficient of variation. I agree. Let's make it a little easier. Estimated A1C is an extension of the estimated average glucose, except everybody was afraid it, that it would get confused with A1C. So they changed the name to Glucose Management Indicator, or the GMI. The GMI looks at the readings for the CGM over the last 14 days. Now, as I mentioned, if it's a flash, you may only have three readings a day, where if it's the real time, you may have gosh, 10, if not more, per hour, depending on how it's set up. No matter what, it takes all that, the mean glucose that happens. The more you have, the better the picture. And it gives you a GMI percentage that could be similar to what the A1C is going to be in three months. Sometimes they do not match up because the A1C is not always accurate that we pull every three months. So there's a couple of guidelines there with the GMIs either lower or higher. Please pay attention to those when you start comparing these. This is not a replacement for an A1C. This is in addition to an A1C, and you use the two numbers to give you a better understanding of what's been going on for this patient. Although with this number, you can get it every two weeks, versus the A1C is every 90 days. So, what does all that mean? It means we have new goals to look at. We no longer are looking at fasting and postprandial. We're looking at a global picture of the time and range, the time that a person is euglycemic, the percentage of time they're above range or below, so hyper or hypoglycemia. Now, turn this around and say, well, what does that mean? How do we quantify that? Well, time and range of 70% over a minimum of 14 days predicts an A1C of less than 7%. You're saying, okay, but hold on. How do we know what the time and range is? What is that goal? If you pop down, you will see that the average target goal, and this is the target goal for your everyday type 1 or type 2 diabetes patient, is 70 to 180. They must stay in this range 70% of every day, or about 17 hours. And then down below, I've given you parameters for hypoglycemia and parameters for hyperglycemia, and you can see the time correlation with that to keep them out of trouble with regard to A1C. So, for example, if I drop down to less than 54, I can only be there for 15 minutes. I need to get myself back up. Otherwise, I'm time below range, and it's too far, and it's going to throw off what my A1C may look like, or as we talked about earlier, how I feel. Obviously, that's a hypoglycemic event. Let's take it one step further. For those that are higher risk or older, and you're looking at mortality rates and what's going on, it doesn't have to be quite as rigid. Look at time and range. It's the same, but they only have to be in that time and range now 50% of the day or 12 hours per day. And then I've listed there, once again, the parameters for hypo and hyperglycemia, or we'll call time above range and time below range. And the time below range is the less than 70 in that particular bullet point.
So let's go to the next step here. I've sort of covered the fact that the ADA said, listen, here are these four pillars. We're going to look at diabetes holistically. We're going to make sure these patients really get a good feel for what's going on. Once we do that, we're going to give them the equipment to bring us data to let us see how well they're doing so we can make good treatment decisions. Well, the treatments are evolving as well. Insulin, if you guys will remember back in the day, used to come from cows and pigs. I tell my students this and they think I'm crazy and I say, no, no, this is how it evolved. And then we had recombinant DNA insulins. We got those that were short, quick, rapid. Now we have those that are intermediate and long acting. So insulins in themselves are niching themselves into a market depending on what the patient needs. A great example of this is called uh, Lumagic. Lumagic is a novel, faster-acting insulin Lispro. You're like, what the heck? Well, honestly, guys, this is one step further than Humalog and the fact that its onset of action is 15 to 17 minutes versus 30 minutes with Humalog. I remember when we were all amazed with Humalog because it was faster than regular insulin. And everybody's like, oh, this is awesome. I don't have to you know, do this 45 minutes to an hour before I eat. I can now do it 30 minutes. This new one, you can do 15 to 17 minutes, and in some cases, even five minutes before you decide what you're going to eat. And many people say, well, what's the big deal? Well, you're obviously someone that's never had to worry about sugars before. Because what happens if you decide that you want a salad, but then you get to the restaurant and change your mind for a hamburger? This allows people to look at what they're, what they're ingesting so they can look at the caloric intake, the carbohydrates, and then make a dose adjustment based on their insulin pump or the way they give their sliding scale insulin for their meals. It also has a peak effect that's 30 minutes quicker than Humalog, which means postprandially, this will make the sugars go down a bit quicker. Again, if they're on CGM, all this can be seen and monitored with all those numbers filtering back to that ambulatory glucose profile. Durations listed there for you as, re as well as the rest of the kinetics. The cost down below, however, this new insulin is about $1,100 versus $600 for insulin less pro. This may play an impact. However, if Congress passes the cap, I'm sorry, if Congress, if they get the cap on insulin through the government, we could see these normalize out so they're more affordable. But for now, just so you know, you are paying almost double for the benefit of this being a faster acting insulin versus Hemolog. And by the way, A1Cs did not change, nor did control overall in the clinical trials. It was just quicker in its actions. Talking about money. This particular insulin is the first biosimilar to Lantus that is interchangeable. That makes it different to all the other biosimilars to Lantus on the market currently. The reason I'm telling you this is because the FDA created a way for the manufacturers to show that biosimilars can be interchangeable. By doing this, that means that the prescriber does not have to receive a phone call from the pharmacist asking for a brand new prescription for another version of insulin glargine. This is the first one to have this. Because of this interchangeability, you now can receive a Lantus script, for example, run it through insurance and see how much it is, and then turn around and run through this biosimilar, and it might be hundreds of dollars cheaper. You can now substitute this for that Lantus prescription without having to call the provider because of the FDA has deemed this particular insulin interchangeable. It is one of the first interchangeable biosimilars on the market. I will talk about others during that pharmacotherapy talk I mentioned earlier. There are a few others that have been approved in 2022, which we can certainly address, uh, 2021 and 2022, that we certainly can address at that talk. Everything is done here. Please look at the cost I mentioned, sort of the discrepancy. Notice that 118 versus 300 or 150 versus 450 for the pens in dealing with insulin glargine of the biosimilar that's interchangeable versus the branded Lantus. All right, hold on to your hats, guys. Talk about a class that had continues to evolve. There are really two classes I'm going to talk about here that are just going crazy for management of type 2 diabetes. One is GLP-1 receptor agonist. We know that GLP-1 is a protein within the gut and plays a significant role in the way we manage our glucose when we take it in through our meals. This particular protein looks to be lower in people that have a diagnosis of diabetes. Now the question is, how low is it? For some, maybe it's low, but for others, it's significantly low. What they're finding when they did the clinical trials is many people who can't seem to get their uh, sugars under control tend to have a deficiency of GLP-1 that's quite large. So GLP-1 receptor agonist is actually given exogenous GLP to a human being. 
This comes from the Gila monster, the saliva, actually. That was how this drug first came into play. Remember, I just talked about cows and pigs for insulin? This is actually using another species, GLP, to supplement a human's GLP to bring it back up to what we'll call par levels. So then the body knows what to do with the meal that we take in. It's really interesting, but because we're introducing a GLP that's not genetically the same as ours, it does have some side effects associated with it. Here are the GLPs in the market. Baeta by far was the first one, but I think Victoza has really became the one most people talk about. Uh, Rebelsis is the first oral one on the market. You can only take it with water, and you can take nothing else with it for around 30 minutes. Its absorption pattern is odd, to say the least. It is a very persnickety drug. So to get it where it needs to be, you have to follow a few rules to take an oral GLP-1. Or you can simply use the injectable semaglutide, which is called Ozempic, and it's the weekly dosing listed down below with Trulicity. I'm going to break each of these down because while the GLP-1 certainly hold a lot of discussion as a class, individually the drugs are starting to separate themselves out with regard to their comorbid conditions and the benefits. Cardiovascular we know that GLP-1s have a significant impact when it comes to cardiovascular disease and the outcomes. And we know that because it reduces the biomarkers, I'm sorry, the inflammatory and the biomarkers of cardiovascular disease. I've listed the pivotal trials here that correlate to each of the GLP-1s. I want to point out, however, that they're not all equal because in the clinical trials, not everybody looked at the same outcome measure. So I'm going to try to summarize this. So talking about major adverse cardiac event outcomes, liraglutide, semaglutide, or ozempic, and dulaglutide had the most impact overall. Those are important because in a moment we're going to talk about what that means in terms of choosing these for people that have ASCVD scores that are quite high or a history of cardiovascular events. You cannot say one is better than the other, but I can tell you that liraglutide has more composite scores and the way it was set up, it had cardiovascular outcomes that were more with what we're looking for, if you will. As I mentioned earlier, not all of them had the same outcomes. Liraglutide most correlated with what we were looking for to decrease cardiovascular events um, and to help people that were at risk either because of ASCVD scores or because they had already had an event. Looking at this particular plot, you'll notice all to the left how these sort of bring out. Look at semaglutide and look at liraglutide. In particular, look at liraglutide. You will see the impact is really quite high. What you don't see here is dulaglutide, and the reason for that is its clinical trial is a little bit different because it looks at a large number of people that is stratified from those who've never had an event to those who've had an event, and you can see that how it breaks down with the percentages. At the end, there was reduced major cardiovascular events in those with or without established cardiovascular disease. Now, I will tell you, just having a diagnosis of diabetes means that you have a cardiovascular equivalence risk factor. However, there were people in the group that had diabetes who had never had a cardiovascular event, and this GLP-1 still had an impact on reducing MACE in those people, just like they did with those that already had an event. That's pretty amazing. That makes Rewind and this trial stand out for dulaglutide versus what we saw with liraglutide and with ozempic or semaglutide. Now, I will tell you they started looking at secondary outcomes only because SGLT2 inhibitors found they had some impact on kidney. And the GLP-1 manufacturers said, okay, hold on, we can't let them get the drop on us, let's go back. So they went back and teased out data from the folks in those trials I showed you looking for impact on CKD, in particular nephropathy. And I've got this listed here for you. I will tell you the data exists. It does look like there is some impact for the GLP-1 receptor agonist when it comes to nephropathy. It's outlined with regard to a number needed to treat, as well as the reduction in protein spilling when it comes to CKD. The Rewind trial actually now is going forward to another trial called the AWARD-7 trial, and it showed the similar results that they saw in the Rewind trial as well. So yes, it does have impact, but it was not the primary outcome in these clinical trials, so this was teased out, trying to make it more marketable, if you will. So they do not hurt the kidney. Matter of fact, they could be beneficial, but they do not have as strong of a data as we're going to see in a moment with the SGLT2 inhibitors. So, in summary, big table for you because we've covered a lot. All of these have some impact somewhere in comorbids, except the oral semaglutide. And that's not because it doesn't, it's because right now the clinical trials just haven't been published yet. I think we're going to see it does have some impact, but the question is orally, does it achieve the same levels that we see with the sub-Q uh, semaglutide? 
Nonetheless, Lyra Glutide at this point is the one that has all three of these areas covered. While Nephropathy is in red to point out that it was a secondary finding overall, Lyra Glutide has the MACE and then the cardiovascular death associated with the reduction. The Rewind trial did show reduction in cardiovascular events, but not death. So that's why Lyra Glutide has been the drug of choice for those with cardiovascular disease at this point in time or those with high ASCBD scores. I could argue that those with high ASCBD scores that have never had an event probably could be on dulaglutide as well, and you should feel comfortable with that. So here's an assessment question. First one, which pair of GLP-1 agonists are also indicated to manage obesity? I've got them listed there for you in pairs. I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to look at that. One of the aspects with this is realizing that liraglutide and semaglutide also have the indication for obesity. Well, what that means is this. Not only is there a cardiovascular action, and looking at these drugs at higher doses, there was weight loss associated with as well. So Saxenda is Victoza's equivalent when it comes to weight loss, but at a higher dose. And you can see it's a GLP-1 that works both in the gastric emptying we've talked about, but we've also discovered that these drugs work in the hypothalamus. It works in what we'll call the, sat the satiety centers or the hunger areas, the appetite. And it tells your brain, nope, you're not hungry. Stop. You're not hungry. And because of that, it actually makes our body go, no, we don't need to eat anymore. And that leads to a loss of weight. Trials show a loss of 3.9 to 5.2 kilos overall, and around 62% reached a goal of 8% within one year. That's amazing. 10% in one year weight loss is considered outstanding. 15% is considered amazing, excellent. So 8% is very good. Overall, though, weight circumference is another measure, and you'll see here a 3-inch weight loss, uh, circumference loss. That actually correlates to a reduction in cardiovascular um, disease when you see a reduction or a risk of cardiovascular disease. Dosing listed for you, it remains at $1,200 a month, and even at the higher doses, this is a little bit more expensive than the Victoza. For the semi-glutide, you'll see I broke this down again, but in this situation, with Govi actually was looked at people that had diabetes and those that did not. And the three trials without diabetes, which means that you can use these drugs, Sexenda and Wagovi, for weight loss in people who do not have diabetes, that is their indication, you will see a significant number of people did achieve a 5 or 10% weight loss, both with and without diabetes I've listed there for you. Overall, the average weight loss across all the trials was about 15 to 18%. That's amazing. When you stop and think about this versus what we just saw with Saxenda, this actually outperforms Saxenda with the amount of weight loss that's been seen. There's also just an ama amazing amount of clinical trials and a lot of public articles that are coming out regarding semiglutide. You will have many patients ask about this. The cost is $1,600 a month. It's a cash pay patient. So let's talk about this last sort of area, right? GLP-1s were a big deal. Well, this year, GIP, GLP-1 receptor agonists made it to the market. This is a combination that hits two different proteins in the gut. I've already talked about the fact that the GLP-1 receptor agonists talk about GLP and bringing it back up to levels. Well, GIP is another protein that plays a significant role with the way we handle our glucose when we take it in. So this particular drug just came on the market with the management of type 2 diabetes as its indication. The dosing's listed for you, but here's the catch. When this one was in clinical trials and they were looking at everything, they also make sure that they were monitoring for weight loss as well because of what was happening with the GLP-1s. What they found when they looked at this GIP, GLP receptor agonist was they had a significant weight loss of 17 to 25 pounds over 40 weeks with an A1C reduction of 2.3%. Both of those were superior to what we have seen with semiglutide in a diabetes dosing, right, in a diabetes dosing. This drug is only being compared to semiglutide at a diabetes dosing, not the higher dose of Wagovi. So even looking at this, at the lower doses of semiglutide, this particular drug actually was superior in the clinical trials against that. Now, there's not a head-to-head -head with Wagovi yet, so we're not quite sure how those weight losses do play a role, but since Wagovi is not indicated, for diabetes management. I know it's confusing, but they're playing the numbers here. Take home message, 1200 bucks a month for the new drug, 
three to four hundred for the oral, I'm sorry, for the injectable dosing of semi-glutide in the diabetes dosing range, not the weight loss of Wegovy, which is still around 16. So I talked about GLP-1s. I've introduced us to GIP, GLPs. There's another class that continues to evolve like no other. SGLT2 inhibitors have been on the market now for a number of years. And I admit wholeheartedly that when they first were launched with Invokana, I thought to myself, is this really a good class to use? I mean, they spill glucose into the, sh into the urine. Is this a good idea? Well, I guess I have egg on my face because not only do they lower sugar and A1Cs, but they have a lot of other impact on the comorbids as well. Here are the ones in the class and the doses listed there for you. Next question, we're sort of getting the mix of what we're doing here. Which SGLT2 inhibitors have been FDA approved to reduce the risk of cardiovascular mortality in type 2 diabetes patients with ASCVD? They're listed there for you, and I'm going to be quick as we go through this. You're absolutely right. Invokana and Jardiance are the two. Per their package inserts, they have cardiovascular impact as well as diabetes impact. And so when we're looking at cardiovascular disease with regard to SGLT2 inhibitors, it's not as profound as what we saw with the GLP-1s, but it does exist, and you'll see in just a minute how it separates out. These are the trials associated with each of the drugs. The infrareg is Jardiance. So one of the things I want to point out when we look at Jardiance versus Invokana versus Barzega, we're looking at that impact on MACE and what happens when you use an SGLT2 in patients who do have high risk for cardiovascular events. Overall, you will see there was a reduced risk of 14% for MACE overall with a specific statistical significance of 38% reduction in death, in death from cardiovascular causes. Infocana showed a reduction in MACE, but no impact on death, and Farzaga and Stergoatro did nothing when it came to MACE. So even though there's a cardiovascular impact with SGLT2 inhibitors, Jardiance by far is the king when it comes to this because of that reduction in death from cardiovascular causes. Now, this is the data that we have right now, but I will tell you more data is coming, especially with Farzaga, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Heart failure. As much as cardiovascular outcomes is one thing, heart failure is sort of rolled into that, but it's separated out here because heart failure exacerbation and reduction in hospital admissions was teased out in the clinical trials when it found that the SGLT2 inhibitors had people performing better with heart failure and keeping them out of the hospital when, than, than when they weren't on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Amazing, right? So why? Well, they think it has a lot to do with the way it works with the renal tubules, with the sodium reuptake and excretion, and how it deals with body weight and blood pressure, and in general, how the cardiac wall stress is decreased overall. With that reduction in the cardiac wall stress, there's decreased cardiac energy. So really what's happened is when you add these two in existing drugs that we use for heart failure, the SGLT2 inhibitors have had impact on reducing exacerbations and keeping people out of the hospital. Here are the trials. Now, specifically, I'll tell you to look at the DAPA heart failure trial because it is probably the one that was designed the best, but the Emperor Reduce trial does have its own um, merits. Invocata's heart failure trial, eh, not as great, and it, probably because it really wasn't a thought process when that was being tested and looked at in the clinical trials, but I'll tell you, here's what we have. Overall, SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure, if you add them to someone on already directed heart failure medications, exacerbations in hospital admissions of heart failure, the rates on average decrease by 31%. In general, the reduction in cardiovascular death is medication specific with only Jardiant showing a statistical significance in the reduction once again that we saw with cardiovascular now we're seeing with heart failure. I'm going to tell you, there is a clinical trial that you're getting ready to see to come out that actually addresses this particular aspect with heart failure and cardiovascular death with Farzaga, and you're going to see that Farzaga actually had the exact same impact. Well, exact same impact meaning the fact that it had impact. I can't tell you the percentages are the same, but it's going to be published soon, if not already out, by the time you and I are talking about this and doing this particular continuing education program.
Ivacana Forzega are approved for use in heart failure, but the patient specifics vary, so make sure you know that. Jardiance, however, is an FDA golden child because it was approved for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction like Farzega and Invocana early on in 2021. However, that indication was expanded in 2022 to include not only the reduced ejection fraction patients, but those with preserved ejection fraction as well. It is the only one currently with a preserved ejection fraction indication. It also found that it does this regardless of people having diabetes or not. That's important because many times you'll see clinical trials of just folks that have diabetes. In these particular clinical trials, they had folks that were a hybrid. Some had diabetes and some didn't, and they simply looked at heart failure exacerbations. That was also true for Farzega. That's why Farzega also has the indication that it can be used in patients with or without diabetes. That just happened in the past year as they expanded their trial and looked at those folks that did not have a history of diabetes and saw that heart failure exacerbations decreased for that group of people as well. So, which SGLT2 inhibitor has been FDA approved for the use in diabetic kidney disease? Diabetic kidney disease. I've listed the generic names there for you. See which one you like. All right, let's see if you caught my trick question. Invacana is the only one indicated for diabetic, diabetic kidney disease. You're like, well, hold on. CKD, there's been articles left and right about these being approved and used. Yes, they is. But this is where the FDA really makes it difficult when it comes to individual products within a class. In chronic kidney disease, this was one of the first things that came out with SGLT2s in terms of comorbidities. We saw them being used in patients with diabetes, and all of a sudden their CKDs were stabilizing, they were not progressing, the GFR was kind of actually getting better, and they weren't going to end-stage renal disease as readily. What they found was this was actually independent of the glycemic control that these drugs have, and that secondary trial endpoint they saw in the diabetes trials led them to specifically look at CKD. And the mech of action looks as though it has a lot to do with the way it works within the kidney, specifically the renal tubular glucose reabsorption, also that interglomerular pressure being lowered, and the reduction of protein in the urine. All of this plays a significant role in the way we look at their management in CKD and how the new trials were set up looking for those new indications from the FDA. Now, I mentioned that Invocana's data wasn't quite as strong, but it's okay. The Credence trial did show that it had impact, and you can see that there was a 27% risk reduction in the spilling of protein or the progression of the spilling of protein. Also, a decreased instance of end-stage renal disease, and also serum creatinine stabilized and stopped doubling. Also, it impacted death secondary to renal and or cardiovascular issues. There were 4,000 people in this trial. This was in type 2 diabetes patients alone and you can see that it had impact with the primary and secondary outcomes. So in CKD, for those with diabetes, it had impact. This data was one of the first to actually show this and led the FDA to give it a diabetic kidney CKD diagnosis. Diabetic kidney disease. The Emperor reduced trial was Jardiance. Now this one went all out. 3,700 looking at heart failure patients. This was the second arm of the trial. So this trial was not dedicated for CKD. They teased this out from the second arm of the heart failure trial that got the indication for reduced ejection fraction heart failure coverage. What they found was the renal composite endpoints. The risk in diabetes patients was reduced by 47% and 58% in non-diabetes. It led them to say that Jardiance does reduce renal composite issues, such as end-stage renal disease and changing the EGFR in those that have diabetes and those patients who do not have a diabetes if they also have heart failure. Thus, that's why you don't see this drug used a lot in the CKD realm because of that very specific second arm off a heart failure trial. However, Farzega created a specific CKD trial. And they went to town to figure out, is it really going to be worthwhile or not, this class, when it comes to CKD? What they did was they mixed 4,300 patients up. Some were on ACEs, some were on ARBs. However, it was a mix. Some had diabetes, some didn't. Some had cardiovascular disease, some didn't. 
much like you saw with the rerun trial in that GLP-1 I talked about, this started looking at people outside the realm of the diagnosis of diabetes. Most in this category were CKD-4 already, so they were advanced stage, and you can see the primary outcomes and the impact this had, including a reduced risk of death from renal or cardiovascular causes across the board, even if someone did not have diabetes and did not have cardiovascular disease. That's why the FDA gave Varzega a CKD indication regardless of the diagnosis of diabetes, not just diabetic kidney disease. So, overall, you will see Invacana, Jardiance, and Farzega have an impact when it comes to EGFR decline and end-stage renal disease. You will see it being added to traditional therapies in patients with CKD, such as ACEs and ARBs, and that new drug I alluded to at the very beginning of the lecture, so I want you to be able to go back and look at that when we do pharmacotherapy. The Credence and the DAPA CKD trials were designed with primary outcomes targeting CKD. However, the Jardiance trial was not. There's more of an impact no matter what, though, in those that were advanced in CKD, although these can be used in people that are in stages 2 and 3 as well with impact. Right now, the FDA approval is diabetic kidney disease for Invacana. Farzega is for chronic kidney disease as an adjunct with ACEs, ARBs, and other products. And then Jardians is off-label for this indication. Here's a summary of everything we've talked about. If you look at this, however, you'll note that Jardians really has the most impact when it comes to MACE cardiovascular disease, and heart failure, although I would argue that if you want to look at an alternative, Farzega actually has pretty good definition when it comes to heart failure and nephropathy, and I think you're going to see a new clinical trial and some data coming out with Farzega reducing death as well from cardiovascular events, uh, and I think that's going to be associated with heart failure too. So you may see some more cardiovascular endpoint data coming from Farzega that may broaden this class so you see Farzega and Jardins fighting it out for drugs of choice. So I could go around and do a little bit of a safety update. I mean, all this data sounds really great about what we're doing, but you also need to know that there are complications with using any drug, as you guys are well aware as pharmacists. But let's review them just really quickly. SGLT2 inhibitors, it's more of a safety issue when it comes to all that higher concentration of glucose headed towards the urine. We know that there's an increased risk of bacterial and fungal infections, and even more so as the data comes out with more and more people from the clinical trials being enrolled. Catch this. If someone has a history of fungal infections or bacterial UTIs, and they're having them many times a year, this is not the class they need to be on. This is not for them, even though it would really work well for their heart failure. It would really work well for CKD. You have to start really talking about the pros and cons here and how that's going to work. Or if you're going to use it for heart failure exacerbations, they need to be on a prophylactic antibiotic at a low dose to keep this away. And of course, that could increase the fungal infections. So you have to be really cautious, especially in women. The other thing that's popped up in the media and, and also in the clinical literature in the last probably two years is something called euglycemic DKA. This is when everything looks great on the labs, but the patient has a high concentration of ketones and a low pH. They're heading to acidotic state, but yet their blood, close, blood glucose is low. They require hydration immediately to correct this. It is not like giving, um, it's sort of trading the traditional DKA. What you have to do is you have to actually supplement the insulin, give some hydration, but it's not to the same extent that you see DKA. So just sort of keep in mind this is a, an, it's an anomaly that has started to creep up with SGLT2s. And also that gangrene is out there. And we already know about the amputation with Invacana. I did not go back over that again. But you need to be aware of that and Fournier's syndrome, which can happen in men, which is really dealing with gangrene in and around the groin area. I did not include a safety Try a safety slide for GLP-1s because most of us know about the pancreatitis, the thyroid cancer, those kinds of things. We also know that GI upset happens with GLP-1s that because we're giving an exogenous GLP to the body and the body's like, what the heck? This isn't my GLP. And so there's some nausea and vomiting when you first start it. But I just pulled an article yesterday that there are now, there's now an association between GLP-1s and gallbladder disease, uh, in particular cholecystitis. So please be aware of that. I think we're going to hear more data coming out from that trial. It was actually looked at where there was an association between um, 
I can't remember the number of patients, but there was actually some deaths associated with cholecystitis and gallbladder disease with the GLP-1s being used. It also stated in what I read from the overview that the cholecystitis started pretty quickly after the initiation of the GLP-1, so it wasn't as though they were on GLP-1s for five years and developed this. It was within a few days, if not a few weeks, that they actually end up having this gallbladder issue. That's brand new, hot off the presses, and not even something I was able to add to the slide set today that two of the SGLT2 inhibitors are indicated. However, Invacana is diabetic CKD or kidney disease, and Farzaga is CKD in general, plus or minus somebody having diabetes. Can you look at GLP-1 when it comes to CKD? Yes. They do, have they do have secondary outcomes that were there. Of the ones that were listed, these are kind of similar. Look at the number needed to treat. Honestly, if I were looking at somebody that had cardiovascular disease and CKD, I might look at Jardiance, although I don't have a CKD indication, but if I looked at Liraglutide, it doesn't have a CKD indication either. So just so you know, you can play around with how these would become first-line therapy based on somebody having comorbids that are more than simply one or the other that we've talked about through this entire conversation. So here's another summary of recommendations when it comes to heart failure, reduced ejection fraction. You don't have a choice. SGLT2 inhibitors. While the GLP-1s do not have an impact on heart failure, they don't hurt it, nor do they hinder it, they don't actually have an impact overall when it comes to exacerbations. We know that these drugs from SGLT2 inhibitors reduce exacerbations in admissions to the hospital. And we also know that Jardians decreases deaths associated. And I think you're going to see the same thing with Farzaga soon. We also know that Jardians covers heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, and preserved. It is the only one that has that. So is one class better than the other? So in a big old summary, here it is. Cardiovascular, you want to go GLP-1s, in particular, I think, liraglutide, by a slight margin. CKDs, stick with the SGLT2 inhibitors. I would say Farzaga here. And if it's a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, SGLT2 inhibitors, and I would stick with Farzaga here, or Jardians. Those would be my two choices, depending on what else is going on. One of the key things I, that I always talk about as I do this is that taking care of diabetes and working with the patients that have diabetes, it's a never-ending learning curve. Over the past two years, data clinical trials have come out left and right, giving us a plethora of new information. It's overwhelming. However, Take a step back and look at those last trials in summary, and I think, I, I hope, anyway, I put it into a workable format where you say, okay, my patient's a 52-year-old type 2 diabetic person that has not had a heart attack, has not had any cardiovascular events, has an ASCVD score of 7.5% or greater, but their serum creatinine is slightly high. Which one would I use here? And that's where you may say to yourself, you know what? I really like looking at the SGLT2s here. Let's see what they look like with UTI history, fungal infections, those kinds of things. So as we get more and more information, we're able to really make plans that are specific for individual patients that have diabetes and not saying globally. Metformin for every type 2 person out there that has type 2 diabetes, it sort of drives me a bit bonkers that we can't think beyond that so far in the game. And then lastly in this, as much as I'm talking about the drugs, we as pharmacists must also go back and look at the technology of CGM. We cannot let that get away from us because working in the community setting, you have access to someone walking in going, here's my ambulatory glucose profile. And you need to understand that 17 hours a day, time and range, is going to predict they're doing a very nice job if their goal is less than 7% for their A1C. That kind of thing helps you tell patients you're on the right track, make sure you get your refill, your dose looks good, especially as we're giving vaccines, we're talking to people about what's going on, we're doing blood pressure checks. We are the frontline caregivers in so many communities, if not all. So please understand that that CGM component I added was not necessarily because I think you're going to run out and prescribe CGMs for patients, but I do think you're going to be the person that may actually help them figure out what to do with it, how to use it, and how the data sets up because they're going to see you far more than they're going to see some of the other uh, brethren that work in the healthcare field.